you talking about the orbital resonance between Venus and the Earth by Emeritus Professor John Dickey, sitting Excuse in the corner. Me. I just noticed that we have an apology from Michael Booth. Michael Booth, right. Um, so he says, my talk will be about the nearly but not quite perfect orbital resonance between Venus and the Earth. This is one of the oldest known phenomena in the sky, but as far as I know, its cause is not understood. Knowing how it works uh, gives us something to think about every time we see Venus. Um, so John uh, has a Bachelor of Science in Physics from Stanford University, Master of Science in Astrophysics from Cornell University, uh, Doctor of Philosophy in Astronomy at Cornell. Um, he's done postdoctoral fellow uh, at the University of Massachusetts. He's Staff Administrator, Observatory of Paris, uh, National Radio Astronomy Observatory, He's been assistant professor and associate professor and full professor at the University of Minnesota uh, in 82 to 2004. That's giving his age away a bit. <laughs> uh, and uh, he's been professor, head of discipline, at, head of school at the University of Tasmania from 2004 to 2020. And he's now emeritus professor. So welcome, uh, John Dick. <laughs> Yeah, thanks very much for coming out, and uh, thank you for having me. Um, I want to talk about something which is at the same time very arcane, but also very immediate. And you may not plumb all the depths of the arcane part, but I hope you'll get, when I get to the end, I hope you'll get what I want you to do, because you have a role in this, and that uh, every astronomer uh, should, should uh, know that. So, I don't know if, you've been, if your eyes have rested on this. First of all, you could say, that the subtitle of this talk is Fun with Astro Pi. I don't know if any of you program in Python, and if you like playing around with computers, but if you do, you should know about Astro Pi, and more importantly, you should know about the JPL Ephemeris. And I've used Astro Pi and the JPL Ephemeris for all the graphics here, including this little movie. You probably figured out what this is. It's the Sun and Venus going around the sky as we see them. And uh, the galaxy I put in uh, with the 21 centimeter emission, but the stars are just sort of the brighter stars. You can see Orion over here and Sirius, Canis Major, uh, uh, Canopus down here. Over here is Crux and Alpha and Beta Centauri. Here's the Scorpion, Scorpius, and here's Sagittarius. Um, the date is down here. And what I've done is to put an eight year cycle that just repeats. And the elongation is the angle between Venus and the Sun. So you can see now Venus is moving away from the Sun, now Venus comes back and crosses in front of the Sun. Of course, the Sun and Venus aren't as big as I'm plotting them there, so usually when Venus comes back, it doesn't actually transit across the front of the Sun. It goes a little bit north or south, a little above or below. But I've blown them up just so you can see them. So I can move on from that. Now, any questions on this movie, though? Where's the ecliptic plane? The ecliptic plane is a big S-curve that the sun is following. It goes south, goes right in front of the center of the galaxy, which is right there. And then it goes north up to about 23 degrees and then south. Venus, you'll see, follows that uh, quite well as well. All right, anyway, I'll go on and let's see. And you said they've been studying this for 4,000 years, is that right? Yeah, this is, in my opinion, the oldest problem in astrophysics, or probably the oldest problem in astronomy. Oh, this thing doesn't want to advance, let's see. Yeah, my yeah. Computer. Thank you. You saw the title. You heard the title anyway. Here we are. So this is tonight, okay? October 26, 2021. 
And the elongation angle is 47 degrees 0.02. And Friday it'll be 47 point about 04, and that's the maximum elongation, meaning Venus is as far from the sun as it gets. We could take a run outside. We don't have a very good western horizon right here, but we would be able to see Venus clearly in the west because it sets after the sun sets by, well, 47 degrees means it would be more than an hour. And if we had a good clear western horizon, it would be very easy to see. And seeing Venus, particularly at times of maximum elongation, is a good thing to do. It's a good thing to do. Some people take that very seriously, others less so. Now, I'll go on. Yeah, so here is my question. And I'll, I'll try to explain what the question is through this talk. My question is, is it just a coincidence that we see Venus so close to an orbital resonance with the Earth? Is Venus just passing through a synodic period with a 5 to 8 ratio to the Earth's, and we just happen to see it that way? And I'll try to explain what all of that means. But let's talk first about orbital resonances. Or let's talk about resonances. So the moon, for example, has a resonance between its rotation period and its orbital period. And that's why it always shows the same face to the Earth. Because as we see it, it goes around and it rotates with the same period. That's a one-to-one -one resonance. That is, one times its period equals one times its uh, orbital period equals one times its rotation period. Now, Mercury has a similar effect with the Sun, except it's not quite as simple. Mercury has a 3 to 2 orbital resonance with the Sun, meaning that its, its period, of orbit, uh, period of rotation is 59 days, its period of orbit is 88 days, and those are in exactly 3 to 2 ratio. What that means is that if you were at the, uh, if you were standing on Mercury, uh, at a certain point you'd see the sun directly overhead. Then Mercury goes around on its orbit. When it comes back to where it was, now you're facing exactly away from the sun. Comes around again, and now you're facing exactly towards the sun. There's reasons for this. There's reasons for uh, the Earth-Moon resonance, and that has to do with tidal dissipation distort the planet that dissipates energy and it comes to a minimum energy state which is a resonance. With the moon it's the, the lowest energy state you can get but you can get locked in a not one-to-one -one resonance. You can get locked as Mercury is locked to the Sun in a more complicated resonance. Now Venus doesn't have a moon and it's a lot further from the Sun than Mercury. So Venus isn't in a, a resonance with its own moon because it doesn't have one. And it doesn't have, it's not in a resonance with the sun because it's too far away. The, the tidal force goes as one over distance cubed. It's a very weak force when you're pretty far away. Mm -hmm. But what Venus does have is a resonance with the Earth. And the resonance with the Earth is that when Venus comes by the Earth, the Earth and Venus are both going around the sun. Venus comes by the Earth, and when it does, that's what we call uh, that's what we call conjunction, or in fact, inferior conjunction, when it's just in front of the Sun or towards the Sun. Then it goes away, and we go away, and it's not until about 1.6 years, about, I don't know, 18 months or so, that it comes back to line up with the Sun. All right, so then it goes on and does that again and does that again, and that's what was in that movie. But after eight times around for the Earth and five times around lining up, the Earth is in exactly the same position in its orbit that it was in at the first time. So we're going to see tonight, or Friday night if it's clear, we're going to see Venus at maximum elongation. All right, so in, in another maximum elongation, in, in a year and a half, a little bit more than a year and a half, Venus will be at maximum elongation. But it won't be October 26th anymore. It'll, I'll show you what it'll be. In fact, we'll work our way through the maximum elongations. But by 2029, October 26th, 
it'll be smack dab where it is tonight. That is to say, there is a resonance, an eight to five resonance, between Venus's synodic period, that is the period we see it going at, relative to the sun, and the Earth's orbital period. So that every eight years, it comes right back to where it was before, eight years before. Questions on that? Because that's really what I mean when I say, is it just a coincidence that Venus is so close but not perfectly on an orbital resonance? Questions on that? Because I, I want you to sort of get what I'm talking about here. Yes. <clears throat> Stefan's doing this. Let's go a little further. Let's take a look. Uh, let's see if this will work. Yeah, so here's just one frame. This is the frame for tonight, October 26, 2021. Here's the sun. Of course, the sun has just set. But the sun was, uh, um, let's see, where are we here? We're uh, just sort of north of Crux at this point. Venus is about to occult the galactic center. It's moving from Scorpius into Sagittarius. I can step ahead a couple of nights here. And uh, let's see, this is still tonight. Oh, yeah, here are the constellations in the background. Uh, you know all the constellations. I won't uh, drag you through that. And uh, yeah, so before I, before I, show you step by step through the cycles. Let me point out the Quetzal. What does the Quetzal have to do with this? It's birth. It's Mayan, Mayan civilization? Yeah, the Quetzal was sacred to the Mayans and later to the Aztecs. And the Quetzal was identified with Venus. One of their main deities was called Quetzalcoatl. I don't want to talk about their deities because they were gruesomely violent and there was a great deal of cruel uh, human sacrifice in their religion. <laughs> However, the calendar was important to them. Several deities are identified with Venus in its ten apparitions. See, Venus goes through five synodic periods in the cycle. But that means there's ten apparitions, one in the evening, and we're at the extreme of that. Then there'll be one in the morning. And then when it comes back again, that's the end of one synodic period. And it does that evening and morning five times over, or ten apparitions. That was so important to the Mayans that they had a different god for each of those apparitions. And, uh, and the, their calendar was based on the apparitions of Venus, not on the Earth's orbit or the seasons or anything normal like that. I'm quoting here from uh, a book by E.C. Krupp, who was a great... Uh, astronomical archaeologist, and he studied many civilizations. Let me just read you what he, he writes in this book. My knowledge of the 584-day cycle of Venus and the equivalence between five such cycles and eight of the sun's tropical years is documented in the Dresden Codex. That's one of the very few Mayan books we still have. Uh, unfortunately, the Spanish burned their library in Mexico City uh, when, when Cortes captured Mexico. But there were a few books that were checked out of the library or something, and they ended up in funny places. But there was one in a, in a big uh, uh, sort of a trunk in Dresden that was found 100 or so years ago. And it has been deciphered. Anyway, the long-term accuracy of the table in the Dresden Codex, Codex is extraordinary. To see why, you have to appreciate what the Maya were trying to do. Armed with the relationship between the solar calendar and Venus cycles, the Maya didn't stop with eight years and five rounds with Venus. They wanted Venus to match with their 260-day ritual calendar, too. And that meant going through more cycles, and they did, with an accuracy of plus or minus two hours every 481 years. They were remarkably good astronomers, even though they didn't have telescopes, but they were very precise. Here are some of our numbers today. Uh, Venus' semi-major axis, that's of its orbit, is that number of AU. Period is about, it's, it's sidereal period, that is, it's actual orbital period is about 224 days. The Mayans didn't know this. 
synodic period is 1.59868 years. The Mayans did know that. And they knew it wasn't 1.6 years. If it were 1.6 years, that would be a perfect orbital resonance of 8 to 5, because 1.6 is 8 fifths. But it's not quite. The difference, 1.6 minus 1.59868, is about 11.6 hours. And that's 11.6 hours different from a perfect resonance in every 1.6 years. Mm. Now, after five of those 1.6 year cycles, that has all added up to about 2.4 days. And that's what's been bothering me for many years. Why would it be so close to a perfect resonance, but just 2.4 days off? And the Mayans knew this. And the Babylonians knew this. If you look at 2000 BC, in the earliest astronomical records from the Babylonians, this is, I'm quoting Krupp again, they knew that it wasn't the perfect 1.6, that is 8 to 5 uh, ratio. They knew that it was a little bit different. Ptolemy took that, and he, let me see, let me, oh, yeah, this is, uh, quickly I'll illustrate. Uh, so here's tonight, and, uh, Here's um, next week. This is next Wednesday. Notice that Venus is now right in front of the center of the galaxy. The sun's moved on a little bit. And uh, here's uh, a week later, the 11th of November. Things are moving along. The sun is moving up the ecliptic. Here's the next maximum elongation that will come in June of 2023. Here's the next maximum elongation. That will come in January 2025. And the next one, August 2026. The next one, March 2028. And the next one, October 2029. Here's Venus. It's just about to occult the galactic center. It's spot on where it was, where it is tonight. Nine, eight years from now, 2029. And that's the point of this resonance is, in eight years, on the very same day of the year, we'll see Venus in the very same place in the sky relative to the sun at the very same time. Okay, get, get the picture? This can't be a coincidence, right? But it's not perfect. It'll actually be two days later in 2029 than it is this year. Now, this was what Ptolemy did with that. What Ptolemy did with that, he put the Earth at the center. It's a geocentric system. He had the Sun going around on a circle. And he had Venus going around the Sun on epicycles. And what that means is that Venus in Ptolemy's system does all of these funny corkscrews. But notice that it has five-fold symmetry. Because for every five Venus cycles, it comes back exactly to where it started. Now, Ptolemy should have known better, because the Babylonians knew, that you don't actually close this figure because of that 2.4 days. It doesn't quite get back to where it started from. And that means that the next time it comes around, say it started here, next time it comes around, it'll be a tiny bit further over. And ultimately, the pattern will completely cover the whole picture. It won't come back on itself. That's the power of an orbital resonance, is that it's a closed system. Even in a funny system like Ptolemy's, it's still a closed curve. Now, this is what Copernicus did with it, and did with, with all the planets. He worked out the relationship between the synodic period and the sidereal period. Because for Copernicus, the sun was at the center. And so he could understand that the Earth and Venus were going around on different sidereal periods, that is, different periods going around the Sun, and that they were uh, passing by each other. And so Copernicus works this out. If you look up on books and websites what is the, uh, the period of Venus, the orbital period, the, the uh, sidereal period, uh, you get this, and then you can work out the synodic period. And this is where I got into the JPL ephemeris. Because you don't really find out these things accurately enough on the web. You don't really find out these things accurately enough to try to figure out if 
Venus is going to stay at 2.4 days in advance of this resonance, or if it's going to change. Now, you can go to the literature, and there's this guy in Paris named J.L. Simon at the uh, Observatory of Paris. And I got about this far into his paper, and I decided it was too complicated for me. Uh, these are all the orbital elements of Venus. And uh, the, the science of the motions in the solar system is a little too complicated for me. That's not my field. So I decided to do it with computers instead. And the solar system ephemerides from the Jet Propulsion Lab are unbelievably, fantastically accurate. And I knew that because we do very long baseline interferometry in radio astronomy, and we use these ephemerides. We have to, because if you're observing a source that's near the sun, the path of the radio waves bends around the sun, just like light does. And you need to know exactly how much bending. If you're timing pulsars, what you find is that by relativity, the clock on the light itself slows down as it goes by the sun and, comes and speeds up again as it comes back to the Earth because of the gravitational potential. All of these things have to be taken account of. Um, there was, back in uh, around 1990, the US launched a Venus orbiter, one of the Mariner orbiters, which had a radio beacon on it, which NASA used that to do VOBI to work out unbelievably accurately the position and the rotation rate of Venus. You know, it's a centimeter accuracy. And they had to do that because the JP JPL, the Jet Propulsion Lab, is a spaceflight center for NASA. And it's a spaceflight center that controls interplanetary spacecraft. Interplanetary spacecraft are spacecraft that leave the Earth. They're not satellites. We don't call them that. But they fly to other planets. Like New Horizons, a couple of years ago, flew to Pluto. In order to navigate an interplanetary spacecraft, you really have to know exactly where the planets are. Because the gravity of all the planets, Jupiter and Saturn, will pull the spacecraft in different directions. And you want that. You build that in. But if you're going to have, let's say, a rocket engine burn for, say, 10 seconds, you want to turn that on exactly at the right time and turn it off at the right time or you won't get to Pluto. So that's why NASA has this, this ephemeris at JPL, unbelievable precision on the positions of the planets. And it's actually a really fun thing to play with because you can just download it into AstroPy and you can put yourself in different places. I'll show you uh, how Venus uh, Venus's orbit, as seen not from the Earth, but as seen from the Sun. First of all, here's uh, a five, this is one full cycle of eight years, but I plotted a second one on top, red and black. And this is the elongation angle, and this is the year. What I showed you on the movie was looking forward from 2021 uh, to 2029. Here, 2021, we're right about here at this, where this curve gets to the top. And looking back nine years to 2014, when it would have just come up in the end of 2013, uh, nine years, nine years, 2022, 14, six, seven, eight years, I'm sorry, eight years. Uh, 2021 to 2029 is eight years, and this is going back eight years from 2022. And so we see these five cycles going through uh, negative elongation, that's when Venus is the morning star. Positive elongation, that's when Venus is the evening star. And so we're right about at the extreme there right now. And I, plotted, I got all this data easily out of the ephemeris and plotted it. And now um, here, see what, what, in order to get the precision that I wanted, on exactly how long Venus's synodic period is, I, I realize that you really have to go to the ecliptic coordinates. The ecliptic coordinates are coordinates on the ecliptic plane, where the Sun is at the center, and the Earth and Venus, well, the Earth just makes a big circle on that plane. Venus goes up and down above and below the plane a little bit. But what we really want to know is, when do we align with the Sun and Venus? And then, when do we align the next time? in order to figure out exactly how long is the synodic period. And so, uh, first of all, this is geocentric ecliptic longitude of the Sun and Venus. That's up in this corner. 
This is like the figure I just showed you, except that it's multiplied by minus 1 because this is some minus minus. So we, this was May 2020, the last, uh, the last maximum elongation for Venus in the evening. And I didn't carry this on. I did this a couple of years ago. I didn't carry it on to where we are now. But where we are now is if you just extend this curve. And then it rapidly turns around. And Venus will quickly move past the sun and then be the morning star. And for us, on this cycle, it'll be just a couple months. Probably by January, end of January, we'll see Venus easily in the morning. Now, you can tell just when this crosses zero. And that's the moment when Venus is aligned with the Sun, the moment of inferior conjunction. But then I realized that actually you don't want to look from the Earth. The better way to do this is to look from the Sun. So the, the programs that, that you can get from JPL allow you to change your position anywhere. I put my position in Sydney Bay where I live, but then I moved it to the middle of the Sun. And in the middle of the Sun, it's actually an awful lot simpler. Because both the Earth and Venus just move gradually around. They don't turn around and come back or any of that. So then I fitted a straight line to this in order to figure out just where it would go through zero. And then I wanted to know how accurate that was. So then I took every other point, the green points, and I fitted a line to that. And then I took every other point, that's the black points, I fitted the line to that. And I looked at how different the result was. And uh, it was three minutes different. So that's pretty accurate. That's good enough for me. I probably, if I knew better how to use this, I might get it even more better. But three months, minutes is pretty good. So then what I did was to plot the time of inferior conjunction, the time when Venus passes the sun, versus years, starting in 2020 and then going on 160 years to the future. And this is in uh, this is in year in days, I guess. Uh, but I, I wanted to guess. I wanted to figure out what is Venus's synodic period really. And uh, so I fitted a line to this, and I found it's 1.5987740, and that's you know to the about the last decimal point there. Notice how there's a a, a cycle of eight years in the Times. So the, 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 there, although there is a good resonance, there's a little bit of noise on that. But that just repeats every eight years. So then I took just for, for every eighth, every fifth inferior conjunction, that is every eight years, I took just uh, every fifth one. So then you get rid of that noise. And this now goes out 700 years after 2020. And this is starting to look like what I was trying to figure out. Because what I was trying to figure out is, if Venus is just 2.4 days different from a perfect resonance, is it going to keep getting more and more different? Or is it going to come back? And here in about, well, the, the ephemeris that you get is only accurate between about the year 1500, 1550 and about the year 2700, 2800. And so this was as much as I could get. And this is that full span of almost 1200 years, a little over a thousand years. And it looks to me like it's trying to be a sine curve. It looks like it's trying to be a little longer and a little shorter. Notice this is in days now. And this is the residuals over the linear fit. So it goes to minus two days and up to about plus two days. And it's at about plus two days now. So what I think this means, and I'm not going to publish this, but what I think it means is that Venus oscillates around a perfect resonance. That at some times it really is exactly eight to five. And at some times it's a couple of days earlier or a couple of days later. And that the period of that oscillation is about a thousand years. So that's my conclusion and uh, yeah one more let me let me just get a little personal here I, I started looking at this stuff because I was outside a lot back in the early 90s and I was outside a lot because I just got divorced I got divorced in 89 
And you know, after that, you, you're kind of lonely. And you, sometimes I was going out with the person in the evening, uh, more and more. And uh, it struck me then, and it has struck me since, that there was something kind of special going on with Venus's orbit, with Venus's. It's not an orbit around the Earth, it's orbit around the Sun, but Venus is set out of period. And I remember this poem. You, if you went to high school in any place other than the United States, you probably didn't have to read Walt Whitman. But that's too bad for you because uh, they make you take American Lit in, in high school in the U.S. And so you read poems like this, When Lilacs Last and the Dooryard Bloom. Does anybody know this poem? Good. Well, I'll read it to you. Actually, it's too long to read. But um, it's a very beautiful poem, and do look it up. And in particular, it might inspire you to be an astronomer, which you are, because of the way he talks about uh, how the stars or the night spoke to him when he was mourning. It's a very sad poem. It was written in 1865, right at the end of the American Civil War. And it, it purports to be about the assassination of Abraham Lincoln whom a lot of people, including Walt Whitman, thought was the greatest man in the world. Maybe he was. But really, it's about all the mourning that all the people in America were doing north and south for the dead in the war. When lilacs last in the dooryard bloomed and the great star early drooped in the western sky in the night, I mourned and yet shall mourn with every turning spring. It has several different, many, many different sections, but one of the most beautiful is where he talks about what the star meant to him when he was out walking in the night. And he talks about the star plunging down into the horizon. And that was, when I was walking around looking at Venus, I thought maybe that's what he was talking about. Because, you know, as he says, uh, we wandered together as I stood on the rising ground. I watched where he passed and were lost in the netherworld black as night. And I think what he might have been talking about was not just the stars setting, but Venus moving rapidly down to the horizon out of the evening sky. So if you plot Venus's elongation, this red line marks the, the day that the night that Lincoln was assassinated. And you see that by 1865, June, Venus had passed through and was now the morning star. Mm -hmm. But in 1865, March, April, and May, it was plunging down towards the horizon, night after night, not, not just because the Earth turns. So I wonder if that's what he was talking about. Mm -hmm. 16 of these eight-year cycles after 1865 was 1993. That was when I was noticing it. And 20 of those cycles will bring us to 2025. That's when we'll see Venus at maximum elongation in about March. Now we're seeing it in the end of October. And in 2029, we'll see it again at the end of October. So, uh, yeah, I don't think I have to drag you through other resonances. S Saturn and Jupiter, let me just show you that. Saturn and Jupiter do exactly the same thing that the Earth and Venus do. If you look at their, their almost, their, their relative periods are almost exactly 0 0.40, which means that the synodic period of Jupiter as seen from Saturn is 0.6742, which is almost 0.6667. Just a very small difference. It's actually, instead of being uh, 3 to 1, it's 2.966. So I think this, I, I think what's happening between Earth and Venus comes from the early solar system when the planets were forming and that they tidally disrupted and linked each other then when the tidal forces were much more significant. I don't think that, uh, that there's much change happening right now. But anyway, what you can do about this, whenever you see Venus in the sky, Think about what time of year it is, and whether it's morning or evening. After eight years, you will see, you will notice that you're seeing the same thing you saw before. And I realized this back in the early 90s, and now it's been several cycles for me. It's starting to become pretty familiar. And I hope you will have many more cycles so that you will notice that you're seeing the same thing. Thank you very much.
Yeah, that's the question. So now we have a period. There should be some kind of physical term which sets that period. But I have no idea, to be honest. Uh, this is about as far as I've gotten. Uh, there must be something, and it must have to do with the coupling. And, and let me say, uh, when radar astronomy was young in the 1960s, people started to work out very accurately from the radar echoes what the rotation periods and the, and the, and the speeds of the planets were. And this stuff was pretty hot then. And you can find a lot of papers written about it between about 65 and 70. But then, but as far as I can tell from reading those papers, nobody explains why this is true. They tried, and, and I think with, with Mercury going around the sun, they explained it in terms of the tidal forces. But I, if you work out the tidal force on Venus from the Earth, it's teensy. And I, I don't see how, see, because somehow the Earth has also locked up Venus's <coughs> rotation period. I haven't, didn't talk about that. But it also shows the same face to the Earth every several times around. Of course, we don't see that because it's covered with clouds, but it, it, it does underneath. So yeah, good question, but I don't know the answer. Mm. I was intrigued as you were talking why or how the 2.4 variance was and, and you preempted that and eventually answered that. I hope so. Well, I don't okay. know. so that then left me with, with the thought, did the minds see that? as well yeah. in their model. Yeah, so according to Krupp, both the uh, ancient Babylonians and the Mayans were well aware of that 2.4 days. And I'm not sure, but I think that, you know, people were talking about the doomsday, something or other, you know, yeah. some years back, yeah. according to the Mayan calendar. Yeah. See, I think they mapped it into a very long period of thousands of years. I mean, maybe this one, I don't know. And that's what sort of people extrapolated to doomsday. Unfortunately, it wasn't doomsday, but maybe it was the beginning of the same cycle. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Would not the discrepancies that caused the, um, the last period you found there uh, be caused by contributions from the other planets? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, and I, I, there was a uh, solar system dynamicist at the observatory of Paris, and I haven't met him. I know a guy who knows him. But I did start reading his papers and, and watching. And he, he runs these giant computer models of the solar system for millions of years, starting from what we know as of today and going forward. And, you know, it, the whole thing gets a little unstable. It's, it's hard to know on a time scale of, say, a, a few hundred million years whether the other planets will actually distort the orbits of Earth or, or, or Venus. Because, yes, I think the effect of Jupiter is probably stronger on Venus than the effect of the Earth. Mm -hmm. But I'm not sure about that. Wasn't that the reason that the, the very age saw those differences? And was it um, uh, Mars's astronomer, Flagstar Field? What was his name? Uh, Claude Tumbo? We found one. Uh, anyway, uh, the chap who made the observatory of Flagstaff Hill about was interested in Mars and looking for people on it. So, oh, Percival. No. Percival Lowell was the yeah. one who, who got into it. Yeah. Didn't he uh, base his um, computations on that kind of a difference? <coughs> I don't know about that. Mm. Mm. The calculations that predicted Uranus and Neptune. Right. That was uh, in the early, in the 1820s, 1830s, 1840s. Yeah. And yeah, I just read a little about that history. It was, it was predicted by somebody and then he sort of backed off and didn't talk about it. There was, it was a British-French thing that was going on. Mm -hmm. And the French, I think, claimed to have uh, confirmed the prediction. Mm -hmm. And I think it was one of the great French physicists who predicted it, mm -hmm. but I'm not sure. Yeah. I mean, first they predicted uh, Uranus based on Saturn's orbit. And then they sort of realized there was still something out there, but they didn't really predict Neptune very well. They accidentally discovered it after. Yeah, that was by Tom at, at the Lowell Observatory. But that was just an accident. Luck. Luck, yeah.
Is that right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it looks too common to be, you know, something just happening. Um, yeah. And the hairy edge of what people are trying to find is whether there's relationships between the rotation of the star and the orbital periods yeah. and some sort of interaction, possibly via the magnetic fields, you know, a bit like the IO. There's a two-three resonances quite a lot, quite often. That's, that's great and not surprising. Mm -hmm. um, what I asked J.P. Beaulieu, and he didn't know, but maybe you know, is do exoplanet systems have Bode's law? Because in a sense, this is an example of Bode's law. Yeah. And I don't want to so get off on those. different Bode's laws. Sorry? There's possibly different Bode's laws, but not our Bode's law. But <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, sometime let, let's look at the numbers. I, I'd love to see that. Mm. Which will. Yeah. And so, could there be something that we just don't know about? Oh, yeah. So, yeah, you didn't know about black holes, for instance. So, could there be something else out there that's doing that that we just haven't found yet? That's having an effect on all of these parents, basically. Like dark energy. Yeah, yeah. I mean, well, I, I definitely think there's things like that out there, mm. but I think you're more likely to, I mean, I'm a galactic astronomer, I think you're more likely to find them in the Milky Way galaxy mm. rather than in the solar system. Mm. Uh, but, you know, certainly Einstein thought that when he worked out the precession of the perihelion of Mercury, mm. and that was a proof of the general relativity theory, mm. uh, which was amazingly accurate after he had worked out the theory. So. There is a lot in the solar system mm -hmm. that we still don't know, probably. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we had a PhD student a couple of months ago talking about black holes, and uh, she said there's speculation that there could be a tennis ball sized black hole out near Pluto. <laughs> Just the strange things happening out near Pluto. <laughs> Who was that? <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, that just, I mean, yeah, there are things, like other things happening that yes. we don't know about. So. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. 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 I, I think we would know. I think we would know. Yeah. Uh, mm. X-rays. Years ago, and someone uh, suggesting that as a solution to very brief X-ray flashes we were yeah. finding. Stefan, I'm sure you know, is an expert on black holes in the galaxy yeah. and studied them a lot. And I've, I've been working with some of your partners. So that did. No. We had no real way of detecting a mini black hole out that far. Well, I guess what I would yes. say to that is this that if the theory of, um, oh, who's that British relativist recently died who was in a wheelchair? Hawking. Hawking, yeah. If his theory is correct, um, a, a black hole of mass less than about 10 to the 16 solar masses, which is a pretty big black hole, 10 to the, 10 to the 16 kilograms, which is a pretty big black hole, would have evaporated in the age of the universe. So unless you have a way of making that, they would all be gone. seeing them flashing out because when they die, when they evaporate, you get this burst of yeah, gamma rays and it's, it's a different that would be a different shape from the gamma ray bursts. And Probably so. And a night. I'm guessing now <laughs> that would be a nice regular shape. That sort of uh, maybe an exponential ramp up in the drop rather than a peak in the drop. Yeah. So yeah. It would be a nice consistent 
consistent shape and it'll probably be pretty pretty damn smooth compared to Yeah, it's funny. When gamma ray bursts were first discovered, we didn't know about Hawking radiation. And then by the time we knew about Hawking radiation, gamma ray bursts had been studied enough that we knew it wasn't that. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you know the story about the discovery of gamma ray bursts? No. So in, I, I remember this, maybe some of you do too. In 1963, the United States and the Soviet Union signed the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty. And that meant we would no longer set off bombs in, in the atmosphere. Um, and that was a good thing. But both sides felt they had to check to make sure the other side wasn't doing it. <laughs> and that was reasonable. Yeah. It was their job. So one thing that is pretty easy to detect from a nuclear explosion is a burst of gamma rays that comes off. Mm -hmm. So they both put up, they were very simple originally, they were just big sodium right, uh, crystals that, uh, on satellites that would go over the other country and uh, see if there were any flashes of gamma rays. And then, by golly, there were. <laughs> After about a year, they both both sides, it turned out, detected these bursts of gamma rays. But of course, they didn't tell each other. No. They assumed that the other one was cheating on the treaty. But fortunately, a few years later, they started to talk. And then there were some papers in the late 60s with Russian and American authors uh, where they compared and showed that they weren't coming from either side. They were coming from space. One dodgy case like the South Africa. Well, that one, unfortunately, <laughs> really was. But the, the detection is dodgy and, you know, nobody really was. There's, there's no question that that was a nuclear explosion. And in fact, it looks exactly like what Don Matthewson saw with Parks in 1963, because the last U.S. explosion wasn't on the ground or even in the air. It was in space, called Starfish. And that set up such a huge wave in the ionosphere that the the guy who was observing with Parks in 1963 saw this huge shift in the polarization that he was looking at. Mm -hmm. And uh, he knew that they had set off the bomb, and he said, this must be what it does. Yeah. Yeah. And sure enough, in 1979, 1980, there was another... You get gamma ray flashes above large thunderstorms. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. the, the few percent of the gamma rays the that's he were detecting were from, yeah. from, uh, from thunderstorms. There were any point sources, were they still? Point sources, were they, those particular flashes? Um, they are. Yeah. In the thunderstorm? It's being a, being a oh, it's thunderstorm. Oh, wow. Uh, were they just um, being one spot well, here and a spot there? Or? Mm. Mm. It's there. All and over the flash? Yeah, it was It was the, the major thunderstorms that tend to be a little bit towards the tropics. Um, after that, I've lost track of the very obvious thing to try and pin them down is mm -hmm. sprites and things like that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Sprites. Uh, yeah. Are there any more questions? <laughs> In time, perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> well, you've had a chance to absorb. Yes. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, actually, uh, we're filming this, so. Yeah, that's fine. You're looking at it on the YouTube yeah. channel. Yes, yeah, that's good. Thank yeah. you. Um, okay, if there's no more questions, uh, I'd like to thank John for coming along, and, and we can understand your we can understand your passion for orbital resonance oh between planets. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, so thanks very much. Thanks for coming. Thank you.